Okay, welcome back everyone. So let's continue with our second part, which is on quantum circuits. So what we use to describe quantum circuits usually is the so-called circuit model, which is a sequence of building blocks that carry out our elementary computations. which are called gates. So we usually start from left to right. So we just have something that we call like a wire, basically from the left is the input. Then we have our algorithm, multiple gates, for example, and then we have an output. And input and output can also be multiple qubits. So let, but let us start with qubits that with gates that act only on a single qubit. So with single qubit gates. And before we go into the quantum gates, let me remind you of a classical example of a classical gate, which is the not gate. So you have an input which can be zero or one. Then you have the not gate and an output, and the output can then be one or zero. Now with quantum gates, we can of course do the same, but well, problem is that something, if you took a quantum mechanics course, you've learned that, otherwise you just gotta trust me. Quantum theory is unitary. Which means that all quantum gates must be represented by unitary matrices. And what a unitary matrix is, is a matrix matrix U for which holds that if I take U dagger, so coupled conjugate and transposed, times U then I should get the identity matrix. And this might sound quite complicated, but actually there's very simple unitary gates. So for example, the first one is the poly X gate. We've seen the poly X, talked about the poly matrices already before. But so let's talk about these gates. So the first gate, the poly X gate is given by 0, 1, 1, 0, which to recap the direct notation, we can write as 0, 1, plus 1, 0. And now we can check the effect of applying such a gate to a state. Let's say we just start in the state 0 and we apply this poly x gate. That means we just apply that matrix to our vector 1, 0. And the output well, if we do matrix multiplication, so we take 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 is 1, which is the state 1. Also, we can check that if we apply the sigma x gate to state 1, and now for this time, it, let's write it instead of in matrices, let's write it in the direct notation. So the gate 0, 1 plus 1, 0, or x gate, times the state 1 is given by, and now we can write it as two terms, 0, 1, 1, plus 1, 0, 1. And actually nice because we can look at the inner product first. This is 1, this is 0, as you remember from before. So we just get 0. So this means this sigma x gate has the exact same effect as a not gate. It turns our state zero in state one and our state one in state zero. So it is what we call a bit flip. And it is the quantum equivalent to the classical not gate. So for example, if we start in state zero, we apply sigma x 
by the way, in the future, you might see it. People might just call it X, not always Sigma X. It's the same thing. And we'll end up in state one. So this Sigma gate and Sigma X gate, the reason or something that is really nice to see as well is that if we consider what it's like on the plus sphere, then this Sigma X gate actually corresponds to a rotation around the X axis by an angle high. So of course, the advantage of this gate compared to a classical knot gate is that it cannot only handle the classical states zero and one, but it can also handle any superposition state. And if we now wonder how it, what happens if we apply that gate to like the plus I state or the plus state or minus state, we can just notice that this gate corresponds to rotation around pi around the Bloch axis. Yeah, around the x-axis on the Bloch sphere. So if we start, the x-axis is the one that points towards us, meaning that if we start in state zero, we just get it to a 180 degree rotation and end up here in state one. If, however, we start, for example, in the plus i state, and we do 180 degrees, we end in the minus i. But if we are in the plus state, we just stay in the plus state because we're already on the x-axis, on the axis around which we're rotating. So this is the nice effect of the x, of the poly x operator. Analogously to the poly x operator, we can also look at the poly z operator. So the poly z matrix is given before. It's 1, 0, 0, minus 1, or in derived notation, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. And if we apply it to the state plus, this is time we will not apply it to state zero or one, but to the states plus and minus. Well, we can see that this matrix times our state plus, which is given in matrix notation by this vector, will give us one over square root of two times one minus one which is the minus state. And equivalently, we can also, and this analogously to that, we can see that if we apply sigma z to minus, we will actually get plus. So this state swaps the plus and the minus gate, which is why we call it a phase flip. And maybe a bit expected now, it corresponds on the Bloch sphere to a rotation around the z-axis by pi. So again, we can just easily, that's why also on the applied to state zero or one, it will not have any effect because we're already on the z-axis, but applied to state, to any state, to any other state, it will just rotate it by pi. And now the last one, is the sigma y gate, poly y, the third poly matrix is given by this. And actually what this corresponds to, maybe if you remember some basics about poly matrices, is that sigma y equals i times sigma x times sigma z. So what this corresponds to is a bit flip and a face flip. So if you think about what happens if I apply sigma y, it's the same as if I applied sigma x and sigma z. And of course, also it, on the Bloch sphere, it corresponds then to a rotation around the y-axis by an angle pi. <laughs> now sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z are, as I mentioned, the so-called poly matrices. And for poly matrices, it holds that sigma i squared for any of them equals the identity matrix. So just ones on the diagonals and zero, zero else, which means if I apply identity to something, it just does nothing, which also means that if I apply sigma x twice, it's the same as doing nothing, 
which makes sense because I'm rotating around the block sphere twice by an angle of 180 degrees. So I'm just getting back to where I started. But now these four matrices, so together the three poly matrices together with identity, they form a basis of two times two dimensional matrices. Which means that any one qubit rotation can actually be written as a linear combination of these four matrices. Which is something that will become very important later when you look at error correction. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you'll hear about that again. But so this is why these four matrices, it's very important and it's really nice to that have to see that they all have such a nice illustrative way of seeing what happens. But now one other important gate, because all these three gates just rotate by 180 degrees. So if I start in state zero, I can just go to state one and back, but I cannot reach the superposition state. In order to reach a superposition state, we need some other gates, some gates that have a smaller rotation and not 180 degrees. And the most famous gate, the one that actually I think pretty much any quantum algorithm I know starts with is the so-called Hadamard gate. So it's one of the most important gates. And the matrix notation of that gate is one over squared of two, one, 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 minus one. And we can see what happens if we apply the Hanama gate to the state zero. We we'll get one over squared two. Just do the multiplication of the matrix of the vector, which is plus. And then I mean, I could also write the Hadamard gate again in direct notation, where I get 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, minus 1, 1. And so if I apply the Hadamard gate to state 1, I'm getting here. This, and we can see that actually with this and with this term, the inner product will vanish. It'll be zero, so we just get zero minus one. Which is the minus state. So what the Hadamard gate does is it creates superposition because it turns the zero state into the plus state and the one state into the minus state. Also, it actually does the opposite thing. So if I apply Hadamard to the state plus, I will get back to state zero. And if I apply Hadamard gate to state minus, I will get the one state. And since this holds, this is something that in general does not hold. In general, you cannot say that if you apply, like if I play, apply a gate to one state, I get another state, and if I apply it to that other state, I'm not in general going back to the state I had before. But here, this holds, which is the reason why we use the Hadamard gate to change between the X and the Z. Basis. We can just apply it in both directions. If I apply a Hadamard it or to something in the Z basis, I go to the X in the opposite direction. Um, in a similar way, we have the S gate, which is given by one zero zero I, and which actually its effect is that it adds 90 degrees to the phase phi, 
the one on the blossphere, the one that oscillates in the middle. So this leads to the fact that if I apply S on the state plus, I'm getting the state plus I. If I apply S to the state minus, I'm getting minus I. So S times H is then applied if I want to change from the C basis to the Y basis. So in this case, if I want to go back, I need to actually swap the gates and like take the complex conjugate and transpose, um, take the dagger and the opposite direction because it doesn't hold as with a Hadamard gate. But still, I can apply these gates to change from one basis to the other, which is pretty nice. And yeah, importantly, we get we can create superposition with that and then start all our quantum algorithms. All right, now that you have seen uh, single qubit gates, we would like to also, of course, see what happens if we have more than one qubit. And for that, I, before going into, into gates on multiple qubits, let's first describe, I should first describe you how to actually describe teach you how to describe states, multi-partite multi quantum states, which are states on multiple qubits, because so far we've only treated single qubits. What we use for that is what we call tensor products. And the tensor product, in case you don't remember that, is if I have a vector A and a vector B given by A1, A2, tensor B1, B2, then I actually get a four-dimensional vector that has the first entry is, I take first take the first element of the first vector, so A1, and I multiply it with the first of B and then with the second of B. And then I take the second element times the first of B, a second again. So we have a four dimensional vector. And so let's quickly look at an example. Let's say we have a system A, so one qubit that is in state one. And I put an A here so that it's clear which one is which. And then we have a state, uh, another system, system B, which is in state zero. Then we can describe the total state, which is then called a bipartite state because we're describing now two qubits. And actually we mostly just use the short notation one zero, which is not 10, importantly, but put here A and B. So it, it's one on A and zero on B just the state that we have looking at right now. It's a short form for saying we're in state one on system A, tensor state zero on system B, which would be vectors zero, one, tensor one, zero. And now if we multiply it, we get zero, zero, one, zero, four dimensional vector. Now a small remark, to this state. If we have a state of this form that I just described, then it is called uncorrelated. Because clearly I have something on state A and something on state B, but there's no correlation at all between the two states. However, there are also some bipartite states that cannot be written in this form. So they cannot be written as some state psi on A tensor some state phi 
on B. If this is the case, then we call these states correlated. And sometimes if they are very highly correlated and have some specific mathematical definition that I'm not going into detail now, but have some very strong correlation basically that can only appear in quantum mechanics, we call them entangled. So for example, if we have the state of psi, psi zero zero, which is the state that we will look at later, it's actually a very famous state, it's a called buzz state. This can be written as one over square root of two, zero zero on A and B plus one one on A and B. And in this case, the vector would be one zero zero one. So that's a so-called bell state, which we use for flotation or cryptography protocols or bell tests. But teleportation you will, for example, learn about tomorrow. But yeah, just to let you know already, there are there's something cool called entanglement, which we will quickly discuss later today. Um, and but this is just a an uncorrelated state. Yeah. Okay, let's see what we can do once we have two qubits. We can look at two qubit gates, of course. And again, I would like to start with a classical example. The XOR gate. So we have two inputs, X and Y. And then we have an output that is x plus y. So we have this, write it nicely, this plus, which is the binary addition. So if we have twice the same bit, so it's a binary addition, we add, add to both bits and then take it modulo 2. However, this is irreversible because if I give you the output, you cannot recover the input. If I just tell you the answer is 1, you don't know whether x was 0 and y was 1, or whether it was the opposite way. And now we get the pro to a problem because I told you before that quantum theory is always unitary, which means that we can only consider unitary matrices. And unitary gates are, by definition, always reversible. So in order to get a quantum version of that gate, we would actually need to find a reversible form of that. But so, okay, let's look at a quantum two-qubit gate. I give you a gate that is called C0. It's probably also the most famous two qubit gate. It has lots of zeros. By the way, of course, all the gates I give you, they're all unitary gates. It's all unitary matrices, which you can easily check. In order to get more familiar with the direct notation when looking at two qubits, let me write this form in this matrix in Dirac notation as well. So the first one in the top left corner corresponds to 0, 0, cat bra, 0, 0. Then on the, the second diagonal element is 0, 1, 0, 1. Then we have the off diagonal elements 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 0. We now apply the C0 gate to, let's say, state 0, 0. Then I have my matrix, the C0 matrix, times this state, which is the 0, 0 state. And actually, this just gives me that as well. The same, it stays the same, so I just get 0, 0 on x and y. If I, however, apply C0 to state 
one zero, I would actually get one one. And you could check that now for all the four basic input states. So zero 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 one one zero and one one. But I'll give you a table where we can you know, write them all down. So we have X and Y. And then we have the two output qubits. So if we have zero zero, we will get zero zero. For zero one, we'll actually also get zero one. For one zero, we will get one one. And for one one, we will get one zero. Now let's note at what if we check the input table and the, the input bits and the output bits, we can note that actually the first bit just stays the same. So the output is basically just X, the first bit. And then the second one, if you look at it, you get 0, 1, 1, 0. This corresponds exactly to X plus Y. Yay! So we basically have the XOR gate, but we also get the X, which means that the whole thing is reversible now. So this actually corresponds to a reversible XOR gate, because we get the XOR bit is just the second bit, but then we also get the X, so we can always construct what the input was. We could always reverse it and given the output, the two output bits, we could always recover what the two input bits were. And let me now show you how this looks for the quantum circuit, how we draw that. So we have two input qubits X and Y and these wires. And now how we draw it is we do here a control dot and then here a plus. Because what we do is we, here we get the X out. So we just, we don't do anything. We just control on that bit until we get the X plus Y out. But how we can see it as well is that for the, the first bit, we, as I said, don't do anything. And for the second bit, we flip it exactly in the case where when the first bit, the control bit, the X is one, then we flip the second bit, the Y bit. Well, if it's zero, nothing, nothing changes. We just stay in the same as we have. This is why this gate is called a C not gate because C not is short form for controlled not. So controlled on the qubit X, we do a not, so a bit flip. And well, nicely, this shows that we can also construct an XOR gate just in a reversible way. And actually what one can show is that every function f can be described by a reversible circuit. So any function that you give me that is not reversible, if I just add some outputs, I can always construct it to be reversible. Which then means that any quantum circuit can perform the same functions that classical circuits could perform. So quantum computing is at least not worse than classical computing. Of course, it might be more complicated. So that depends on the implementation and on the hardware and everything. But at least it's clear that everything could, in principle, also be done on a quantum computer. Good. So now the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about today is what we call entanglement. And I would say that next to superposition, entanglement is basically the second big feature of quantum computing, of quantum systems. Because quantum systems, they have superposition, which makes them really fancy, and then they have entanglement, which makes them also really fancy. Um, which is some kind of, as I mentioned before, some correlation that is just really strong. 
that is something that we cannot observe classically. So we can, for example, construct experiments where we can do some measurements and we can get some correlations between systems that between two qubit two qubits where we can show that this where we can prove easily that classically one could not get such correlations, but that they only appear if we have quantum systems that are entangled. So let me give you a definition of entanglement. It's now a bit simplified because I restrict it to pure states. As I, as you learned before, there's also mixed states. And for mixed states, it's not that easy, but this we won't go into that detail now. So we just consider pure states and a pure state that acts on two systems A and B is entangled if it cannot be written as some state, some arbitrary state phi on A tends to some arbitrary different state on B. Before I told you that this means only that it's correlated, which, well, this is, means that it's uncorrelated and that there is something, some correlation that is not entangled that definitely exists, but just not for pure states. So for pure states, it's just much simpler. So if we cannot write it as a tensor product, we know that it is entangled. But okay, we're not gonna go into much more detail here, but what we want to consider is consider is four very specific states that are maximally entangled, which are the so-called Bell states. So we have different kinds of different, like entanglement can be, we can have a bit of entanglement, but we can also have strong entanglement. And so these four so-called Bell states are state of four states that are maximally entangled. So there's different measurements of entanglement, which we also won't go into detail, but in any measure, they're always maximally entangled. And they, these four states build an orthonormal basis. So the four states, they have different names, but the one I prefer is the one that is, that makes the teleportation protocol very easy to understand in the next step and have a nice generalization, generalized way to write them. So let's go with this one. I'll call the first one Psi zero zero. I've mentioned that quickly before. It's just zero zero plus one one. Then we have the state psi zero one, which is zero one plus one zero. Then we have the state one zero, which is defined as zero zero minus one one. Now I'm sure you can guess the last one. Yeah, I forgot the one over square root of two. And here we have also one over square root of two. And then zero, one, minus one, zero. So the way, the reason I named them in this, them in this way, is that now we can just write them in a general form, which is psi ij equals identity applied to the first qubit, tensor, and now to the second qubit we apply sigma x to the power j times sigma z to the power i. And so this all is applied to the first Bell state. So what that means is, okay, if I have just psi zero zero, then i and j are zero. So I'm not doing anything. Okay, I'm simply staying in psi zero zero, sure. If I have, for example, psi zero one, then this means that i equals zero and j equals one. So I'm sigma z to the power zero is just identity, nothing happens. But I'm it means I'm actually applying the sigma x gate to the se second qubit. So 
on the state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. I'm flipping the qubit of the, the second qubit. So it turns into 0, 1 plus 1, 0. And similarly, if I have, for example, 1, 0, I'm just applying the Z gate. So I'm changing the face of this, the chain, changing the face of the second qubit. So I'm getting a 1 minus sign for the second state. And if I do both, then I'm getting on the last, last state. And let's very quickly see how we can actually create these bell states. These super cool maximally entangled states are actually not that hard to create. And we only need two gates that we've seen already. Oh, we can start with, let's say we have two qubits, i and j, that are both initially in some computational state, so either in zero or in one. I have no entanglement yet, it's just some initial state. We apply a Hadama gate and then a C0 gate. I told you everything starts with a Hadama gate. And then the C0, which we just learned about. And now my claim is that then in the end we will get the state Psi IJ. Let's quickly check that. So the initial state here is I, J, A, and B. We have four different combinations. We just look at these computational states and then superposition everything else follows. And we apply Hadama on qubit, on the first qubit, on qubit A. So we go get here to Hadama on A times identity on B. Is this like the first in the first step? We're not doing anything on the second qubit. Apply to ij. And then, while well, applying Hadama gate to state zero gives us zero plus one. We saw that before. It turns us into turns into the plus state. Since we're not changing the second qubit, we just get zero zero plus one zero. And then, of course, the normalization factor one over square root of two, which also comes in from the Hadama gate. And for the state zero one, we get the same just with the second qubit staying in one instead of zero. If, however, the first qubit is in one initially, then we get the Hadama gate turns one into the minus state. So instead of zero plus one, we will get zero minus one. So we will get zero zero minus one zero. And the same but with a one on the second qubit, we started in one, one. And now just the second step where we apply the C naught gate controlled on R targeting qubit B. So let's look at the first combination. So controlled on state qubit on the first qubit, if it's in zero, nothing happens. So we just stay the second qubit does nothing. If, however, the first qubit now is in state one, then to the control qubit, so the first one, nothing happens, but the second one flips. So from zero, we turn into one. So we turn into that state, which, which is indeed psi zero, zero. Then if we are in here, for this case, we have, well, here again, if it's the first one, since it's always in zero, nothing happens to the second qubit, but we just swap the second one. And this is psi zero one, indeed. Let me see it again. Then here we get zero zero, and we can flip the second bit qubit. And this is indeed psi one zero. And then also the last one, we get zero one. And here we can flip the second qubit and thereby get psi one one. Good. And just the last thing that I want to mention now is that we can also do this creation of ball states. We can do the opposite direction. The opposite direction is what we call a bill measurement. So we basically project onto the bell basis. 
So let's say I give you a state and I tell you it's one of the bus states, but you don't know which one. And you want to figure out which one it is. Then you just apply the opposite direction of the circuit. So you first do the C0 gate, and then you apply a Hadamard gate. And then you just measure in the computational basis. So you will get an I and a J out. So this here, these are just measurements in the zero one basis. Because the problem is that like physically, you can usually just measure in the zero one basis. You cannot measure in the bell basis. But now, because we applied the other two gates before, we just, if we were in the state psi zero zero before, then by going backwards, we would go, we would end up in the state zero zero and so on. So if we, our classical outcomes that we measure, I and J, they actually correspond to the state, to a measurement, to a measurement of the state psi i j that we were initially in. So if you measure 1, 1, you know that the state, if you measure here 1, 1, you know that the state here was actually psi 1, 1. Okay, you don't know whether it was that state, maybe it was a superposition of some other states and you just had a higher chance to measure that. But so if I want to do a projection onto the four bell states, then I do apply the C0 and the Hadamard gate, which basically trans, uh, transfers me from the normal basis to the bell basis. Let us just continue now with teleportation. So you've seen your very first algorithm already in the second hour. The goal of teleportation, as fancy as it sounds, is that we have one party, called Alice usually, who wants to send her unknown or potentially unknown, doesn't matter, but it can even be unknown, state that she possesses, state phi, and I have an index S for like the system, which has any arbitrary amplitude alpha and zero plus beta times one. Alpha and beta can be uh, some complex numbers. And she wants to send that state to Bob. Bob can potentially be super far away. She could be on the moon, whatever. But the thing is that she can not physically send him something, but she can only send him two classical bits. So she cannot send the quantum state itself, and it would be boring, and it's not teleportation. But she could, for example, let's say, send him a text message saying, hey, my two bits are zero and one. Importantly, for the teleportation protocol to work, they both need to share the maximally entangled state or some maximally entangled state. But for what well, we will just choose for convenience, the first ball state. So we'll choose the state psi zero zero, A and B for Alice and Bob, zero zero plus one one. So it's important that they shared that so they could have met like last year if coherence time were long enough and uh, shared this entangled state and then they well, Bob flew to the moon or traveled somewhere else in the world and now Alice can still send him her potentially unknown quantum state which can be in an arbitrary superposition of zero and one and alpha and beta can be any arbitrary complex numbers. So, in order to see how the protocol works, it's basically just one thing that one really needs to understand, which is understanding the initial state of the total system. And well, okay. Of course, one could just say, oh, it's phi, 
on the system, tensor because it's not correlated, the state psi 0, 0 on A and B. That is correct. But okay, we can now rewrite that initial state a bit more to then see how the teleportation protocol works. So it might seem like a bit more complicated that the way that we're going to write it now, but then you will see later why we're doing this. So let's rewrite all the states that we have. So phi is an alpha times zero plus beta times one. And we get the factor of one over square root of two from the psi zero zero. So we get alpha times zero zero zero, S, A, and B. It's important now to put the indices so you know which bit belongs to, pure bit belongs to which system, plus alpha times zero one one plus beta times one zero zero plus beta times one one one. And now we actually need to do another step where we rewrite it again in an well, maybe even more complicated way. And maybe it's not completely obvious that this holds, but you can do the calculation and then or just trust me. So what we can see is that we can basically add and uh, subtract some states and then in the end write the full state like that. It's going to be a long expression now. So this is the first thing you can see the zero 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 if we multiply the first terms gives us the first terms then if we multiply uh, but then the other terms for example one one zero does not appear did not appear before so that's one of the terms that we add but then you will see we'll also subtract it So now here we have even more terms. Now we have basically all the terms that we had before, though with a factor of one half, and some extra terms that we still need to reduce, uh, subtract, which we're going to do now. We get a third term for SA. So what you can see now is that the first and the third term have all have both positive signs for the terms that we actually want, and they have opposite signs for the terms that well, that we didn't have before that now cancel out. And the same now for the second and fourth term. So that is it. That's the same as the line before. And the reason I wrote it in this way is because writing it like I did in the very beginning is not so helpful because, well, Alice in the end has the system as an A and Bob has system B. And things that can, Alice can do, she can do on S and A together. So it would be good to have some expression of states on S A together. So in this way we can write it now because, well, remember, 0, 0 plus 1, 1 is just our state psi 0, 0. And well, the square root of 2 factor I now took out. So times, and now alpha times 0 plus beta times 1, if we check, that is exactly our state phi. However, it's now state phi, but on system B. Then the second term is, if you remember the bell states from before, it's the state psi 0, 1, another bell state. 
tensor. And now the second state here on Bob looks very similar to the one that before, so it looks very similar to the state phi. However, the bits are exactly opposite, which means that it is just the a sigma x applied to state phi. Sigma x, the one that flips the bit. Then the third term is the state psi one zero. And now we have again for Bob something very similar, but with a minus sign. So it's sigma z tensor phi. And then the last term corresponds to psi one one tensor. And now the state alpha times one minus beta times zero is the same as if we applied first sigma z, then sigma x to the state phi. So remember, we always go from, from right to left because that's how we do it with the matrix multiplication. Okay, so this is our state. And now I can just quickly draw you the, to you the protocol of the teleportation. But given that the initial state, I just rewrote the initial state, remember that, is given by this expression, you can actually we can quite easily show that now how the teleportation protocol works. So, okay, we'll have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they're spatially separated. I'll put some dots here, but they share the state psi zero zero. So we have one goes to Bob and one goes to Alice. Alice also has the state phi. And now what Alice does is she performs a bell measurement, which you just learned about. And then the outputs that she gets are two classical bits, bits i, bits j and those shoes are the two bits that she's going to send to bob who then applies sigma x to the power j and sigma z to the power i if i equals one he applies sigma z if j equals one he applies sigma x otherwise he doesn't apply these operations And now the claim is that the state that Bob receives is the state phi b. So we have three steps. The first step is Alice performs a measurement. On S and A, so on both of her qubits in the bell basis. So this is the first step. And let's see what happens in that case. So we have here Alice's measurement, which then immediately implies up state. So Alice can measure basically one out of the four states, right? She can, if she projects onto the bell basis, she can get either psi zero zero, psi zero one, psi one zero or psi one one. Or let's have a look at the initial state that we had here. If Alice measures psi zero zero, then since all of these other three states are orthogonal, it is clear that the, the state would collapse. We do an orthogonal measurement. So it is clear that our state collapses to that part and none of the other states. We will not have any of the other states. So it is clear immediately that Bob will then be in the state phi. While analogously, if she measures psi zero one, Bob will be in the state sigma x times phi and so on. So once Alice did her measurement, she knows the state of Bob. So then she 
objects Alice can send for her two bits i and j. And so in the case, she just sends the two bits that correspond to her bell measurement that she measured there. So in the, case, the first case, it would be zero, zero. It would be zero, one, one, zero, or one, one. The second step here. She sends her classical bits i and j to Bob. This is the second step. And then the third step is Bob applies according to i and j. He applies sigma z to the power i times sigma j x to the power j to his qubit and thereby gets the state phi. So third step, what does Bob apply? And then what does it tell us about Bob's final state? So in the first case, we're both a zero, he does not apply anything. So he just keeps it, does identity basically. Then if j equals one and i equals zero, you just apply sigma x. Here you would apply sigma z, and here you would apply sigma z times sigma x. Oh well, if he applies identity to the state phi, his final state is just phi. If we apply sigma x to the state sigma x times phi, we have twice sigma x. And as we learned before, poly matrices, if I apply them twice, they give identity. So we'll also get phi b. And then the same holds for sigma z. And here we have both operations, but they also cancel. So in any case, he will receive the state phi. Great, so teleportation works. But now one thing that is really important to note is that Alice's state during the measurement actually collapses. because she projected onto the bell basis. So she will only get two output bits, 0, 0, 0, 1, or one of the others. But that means that she does actually not have the initial state, the initial state phi anymore. This is also expected. due to the no cloning theorem. Which tells us that you cannot copy a state, an arbitrary quantum state. So if she was able to keep her state and send one to Bob, she would have copied it. Right, so this is not possible. So she can actually not copy her state, but if she's, she can send it, but once she sends it, when she sends her state to Bob, it is clear that she must be, let's say, destroying her own. And as a nice anecdote to that, in case you've seen the, um, the, the famous movie with the two magicians. They're the one that also like he teleports himself, but then he also ha always has to destroy his first copy, like his original per himself before cloning and tele before teleporting, and then so that he cannot clone himself in the end. Uh, the Prestige, by the way, sorry, the name of the movie. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and I hope you learned about teleportation now and you're happy to and not too disappointed that you cannot teleport yourself and just anywhere but that you would actually need to destroy yourself before teleporting somewhere else so all right bye